Hi there! As our previous video on the R100 was so popular, and thanks for all the feedback on that, and with so many requests, we thought we'd add to the series and do a walkthrough of the R101, so welcome aboard. Before we begin the tour of the ship, let's take you back to a little bit of history and the story behind the ship itself. The R101 was designed in 1926 by the design team at the Royal Airship Works Cardington, led by Lieutenant Colonel Vincent Richmond and assisted by Squadron Leader Michael Rowe. The ship was to be one of the two new ships designed as part of the Imperial Airship Scheme, looking to connect the far corners of the British Empire. Before the work could begin on the ship, and due to the specific needs for this new airship project, the existing shed at Cardington was deemed too small, and so it had to be raised and extended to accommodate the new class of intercontinental airship. A second shed was also needed, and so the existing airship shed was dismantled from the Royal Naval Airship Station at Pulham, and then erected and enlarged next to shed number one at Cardington. Work began on the ship in 1926, and over the next few years, the 730-foot framework of the new ship grew and filled the gigantic shed. The R101 was of a new aerodynamic design, and looking to carry up to 100 passengers across the oceans in comfort not seen before. The ship made her first flight on the 14th of October 1929, and then made a series of test flights over the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, as we all know, it was almost exactly a year later, on the morning of the 5th of October 1930, when the ship was tragically lost on her first intercontinental flight to India. In the past, we've only been able to guess what it was like to be on board, and studying the plans and imagery from grainy photographs of what it would be like to travel on the ship. However, thanks to the artistic talent of Marshall Young, we can take a tour of the inside of the R101. Before we begin this tour, just to let you know that the R101 had a number of changes made to the layout and configuration of the ship. We have interpreted how the ship would have possibly looked on her final layout in October of 1930. The passenger accommodation was situated in the main hull, consisting of two decks, and sitting below the giant gas bags which gave the ship her lift. Now let's start and begin the tour, and take you to the main passenger accommodation on the upper deck. Upon embarking the ship, using the lift on the mast, the passengers would have entered via the entrance in the nose, and walked down a gradually sloping covered walkway to the main accommodation. Passing a number of doors on the lower deck, they would have walked up the stairs and then entered the main accommodation. We'll start by entering the passenger lounge. This was the largest open space ever designed on an airship. With the seating arranged around the sides of the lounge, with small tables available with lightweight, comfortable wicker chairs and cushions. There were also writing desks along the side of the lounge with R101 headed stationery. The walls themselves were actually heavy-duty cloth painted white and gold. The columns were metal, but were covered with thin veneers of light balsa wood painted again in white and gold. The electric lamps provided additional light. Pictures on the walls were watercolours of scenes of the English countryside and cloudscapes. For this video, we've also included Lord Thompson's famous rug, which was loaded on board on the final flight, and was going to be laid down at the drinks reception at both Ismailia in Egypt and Karachi. It's good to see what it would have looked like in the lounge, and as you can see, it fits in really well. On either side of the lounge, passengers would walk up three small steps, and then onto one of the most striking features of an airship, and that's the promenade decks. The promenade deck on the R101 had floor-to-ceiling windows flush to the hull of the side of the ship. The view would have been wonderful just to sit and watch the world below. There was a rail to lean against, along with a small footrest, and the feeling would have been very similar to that of being on the deck of a ship. To separate the lounge from the promenade deck, there were curtains which were open in the daytime, but at night these were drawn closed. This would have given a much better nighttime view out of the windows of the lights of the world below. A passageway led from the lounge into the dining room. Again, this was a large light room with windows down one side of it. The tables were laid out in rows and the chairs were again made of wicker for lightness. The dining room could accommodate up to 50 passengers in one sitting. The food was brought up from the kitchen below by a food lift known as a dumb waiter, and the stewards would have served the food then to the passengers. A radio was wired into the wall to provide music whilst the meals were being served. 
Moving across from the dining room, now let's take a look at the main passenger accommodation. Despite seeming sparse by today's standards, each cabin had a large porthole light. The cabins were either two or four berths, and despite no hanging space, it was expected that a single cabin suitcase would be stored below the bottom bunk. As the ship was lighter than air, it was essential that weight could be saved where it could, so there were no doors, but a heavy curtain would be used for privacy. The cabins were small but comfortable, along the lines of a Pullman coach on a train, and it was expected that passengers would spend most of the day outside of their cabins in the lounge. We're showing a two-berth cabin just for the layout comparison. Again, as you can see, it would have been small but comfortable. Now let's go downstairs for an even further look into the crew space and the crew deck. At the bottom of the stairs, there was something that was very unique on this airship, which was a smoking room. Remember, this was the 1930s, and people always smoked. It was deemed safe because the floors and the ceilings were made of asbestos, which was non-flammable. So let's take a further look around what else is on the lower deck. There was the chart room and also the forward corridor to the bow entrance. Opposite this there was the galley and the food lift up to the dining room. Moving further aft, you had the cruise quarters and the toilets. Compared to the passenger space above, the crew area was seen as quite sparse. However, this is where the crew would have spent a lot of their off-duty time. Moving further forward, the navigation and chart room was also the meteorological room. And also close to this was a ladder which connected down to the control car which projected underneath the ship. It would have been an amazing experience to look around her and enjoy the public spaces while flying. And it's something unfortunately we can't do today. We hope you've enjoyed this tour of the R101. And if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and also subscribe to our channel as we'll be adding more airship related content to it in the future.